please be seated. Good evening to colleagues, friends who've joined us this evening. And I'm told we are live streaming, so everyone who's joined us online. My name's Ruxana Osman, and I'm the Senior Deputy Vice Chancellor hosting this lovely evening this evening. Um, let me extend a really warm welcome to you, Professor Matt Hilton, and particularly to your family. That's on my left-hand side, and I see Arco has joined us, so a warm welcome to Mrs. Hilton and your son, and then to the senior Mrs. Hilton, who's traveled a long way from the UK, a very warm welcome to Johannesburg and to Wits University, and to Matt's brother, Chris, very warm welcome. I want to also extend a welcome to colleagues from the Faculty of Science and from outside of the Faculty of Science. And then to yourself, Dean Chetty, welcome. And to Professor Naidu, who's the head of the School of Physics, a warm welcome. So this evening is very straightforward. I get to host the evening and enjoy the evening and hand over the tasks to the Dean then. So over to you, um, Professor Chetty. Good evening, colleagues. Um, Madam Senior <laughs> Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Rukshana Osman. It is my pleasure to present uh, Professor Matthew Hilton from the School of Physics in the Faculty of Science to deliver his inaugural lecture on the topic of galaxy clusters across the universe. Professor Matthew Hilton was appointed as professor in the School of Physics at WITS in July 2022. He obtained his master's degree in physics and, and astronomy from the University of Sheffield in 2003 and his PhD from the Astrophysics Research Institute, Liverpool, John Moores University in 2007. He subsequent, subsequently worked as a postdoctoral fellow <clears throat> at the UKZN and the University of Nottingham prior to obtaining a permanent academic position at the UKZN in 2012, where he spent the next 10 years. His research interests are galaxy formation and evolution and observational cosmology, with a particular focus on galaxy clusters, the most massive gravitationally bound structures in the universe. Originally working as an optical and infra infrared astronomer, he subsequently used many different techniques both on the ground and in space, covering much of the electromagnetic spectrum between X-rays and radio wavelengths. Madam Senior, Senior Deputy Vice Chancellor, I present to you Professor Matthew Hilton for his inaugural address. Hi everyone. Uh, ooh, the more slides. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for the welcome. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for coming out on this cold, cold night in Joburg. If you're here in person, thanks if you're online. Um, yeah, so today, for a change, I'm going to be telling you a bit about uh, galaxy clusters. Okay, so uh, as just mentioned, I did my PhD in Liverpool. Uh, so the title of my talk is Galaxy Clusters Across the Universe. Um, trying to find my mouse pointer here. Okay, here we go. Um, so you'll see uh, I've skillfully edited this film poster. There's this film called Across the Universe, the Beatles music in it. I've not seen it. IMDb says it's seven point something. Maybe it's worth watching. But I've got rid of the big strawberry and people kissing and replaced it with a picture of a galaxy cluster, which is clearly much better. Um, if there are any nerds in the audience, you'll see I've changed the tagline, so all you need is Python. Uh, that's not quite true. So yeah, Python is a programming language. Um, yeah, you also need uh, lots of uh, good collaborators, uh, nice instruments, and, and so on. 
uh, to be able to do all the stuff which I'm going to be talking about today. Okay. And yes, yeah, so, uh, thanks to all the... Um, well, 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 we'll mention some people as we go along, but thanks to the, the collaborations I've worked in, I've been fortunate to work with some very talented students and postdocs, and uh, yeah, long may that continue. <laughs> okay. So here's the uh, outline of my talk. I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about what galaxy clusters are, why they're special, what we can learn from them, uh, particularly across the electromagnetic spectrum, um, stuff I've been doing more recently, how do we find galaxy clusters, uh, what can they tell us about the universe as a whole, so we'll get onto something to do with cosmology, the mysterious dark matter and dark energy, which is making up most of the universe, and uh, what we can hope to learn in the future. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so hopefully this talk is quite general. Uh, we do have a less than two-year-old in the audience. We'll see how long that lasts. Uh, but he's been training for this. So here he is. He's, he's studying hard there. Um, and I'm told if you're watching online that the top right-hand corner is where the video is. So maybe we, I was thinking of putting pictures of blue in the top corner. So the Australian Broadcasting Corporation won't, won't pick that up on YouTube or anything. But no. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we won't do that. So we'll see, we'll see how long this experiment lasts. Um, if, if also, if you're sort of struggling, maybe think about Bluey. It's, it's quite good. Anyway. <laughs> OK. Um, so I'm going to begin um, by starting on Earth <laughs> in, our, in our galaxy. So this is a picture taken by Mamita, my wife who's over there. Um, this was when we went up to Sutherland. So this is on the road up to Salt. Um, and I just wanted to show this um, because we're in South Africa. It's really a great place to look at the night sky. We've got some of the darkest skies on Earth. And this is a fairly modest, this is like 30 seconds of exposure on a regular camera of the night sky above Sutherland. So if, you get a, if you've not been to Sutherland, you get a chance to go. I, I recommend it. Um, we're in the Southern Hemisphere. We can see uh, this uh, blobby stuff. This is the Milky Way. Oh, hang on. Where's my mouse pointer? This is quite tricky to do. <laughs> Where is it? There we go. Right. So this blobby stuff is, is the Milky Way. Um, we're sat inside it. Uh, this is a galaxy. Uh, and it extends across the whole sky there. OK, um, so um, if you could uh, take a, a whole sky map, right? So the southern hemisphere, we, we're only seeing half the sky uh, or so. Uh, the whole Milky Way looks like this. So we're still sat in it. Um, so it looks like a, a horizontal band in this image. This is the galactic plane. So it's sort of like a big dinner plate type thing. You can see lots of dust. So the galaxy is, is a fairly dusty place if you look at optical wavelengths. And this map is something made by the, by the Gaia mission, which is a European Space Agency mission. Uh, the other thing we've got going on in the southern hemisphere is you can see these little galaxies next door. So these are the large and the small Magellanic clouds. Okay. So, so this is where we're starting. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go out a little bit into the universe until we run into a galaxy cluster. And, 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 we'll, and we'll look at those. Okay. So firstly, um, being sat in the Milky Way, it's actually kind of tricky to work out what it looks like. Um, but if, but if you could go outside, it would look something like this. So this is our nearest big neighbor galaxy. This is Andromeda, so M31, uh, if you like. Uh, and um, this is a, a spiral galaxy. It's a bit bigger than the Milky Way. And this thing is actually heading towards us. And if we wait long enough, maybe it'll, you know, it's going to collide with the Milky Way. But we'll all be dead by then, so let's, let's not worry about that. So this is about uh, 2 and a half million light years away, or 770 kiloparsecs, right? Okay, so keep that in mind, roughly one megaparsec, as we're going to see later on, that's of order the kind of size of a galaxy cluster, right? So our nearest neighbor is sort of that sort of distance away. So if you make a little map of, of the local universe, this is what it looks like. So this is our local galaxy group. I'm going to play Hunt the Mouse Pointer again. Okay, so the Milky Way is, is, is handily highlighted here in red. This is a, we're in a fairly respectable sized galaxy, the Milky Way. Andromeda is over here, 770 kiloparsecs away. And in our local group, there's not uh, too many galaxies, and the ones we have are pretty weeny, right? So there's lots of weeny galaxies around. There are large and small Magellanic clouds and satellites of the Milky Way over here somewhere. There's no way I can read this from this distance. <laughs> and over here, we've got Andromeda, right? So if we lived in a galaxy cluster, this whole space between these two galaxies would be filled with other galaxies, right? So imagine if you lived on a planet in a galaxy cluster, you looked up at the sky, you had exceptionally good eyesight, you'd be able to see lots of galaxies uh, floating around the place. Okay, so it's about two and a half million light years if you go to Andromeda. 
If we, if we carry on further, we go past the pinwheel galaxy. This is just excuses to show pretty pictures, really. Um, so this is a, another spiral galaxy, fairly close by. This is 22 million light years away. So it's taken the light from this galaxy 22 million years to get to us. And then eventually, we would run into our local or the nearest cluster, which is Virgo. So this is about 55 million light years away. OK, so uh, <laughs> this is quite tricky. So here's the, the local group. Here is Virgo. We've gone past M101 on the way. It's 55 million light years, we've hit a galaxy cluster. So when we get there, so, so far we've just seen a couple of pictures of spiral galaxies. When you look at a galaxy cluster, uh, so here's a pretty picture of Virgo, um, you start to see that the galaxy population is different. Okay? So the galaxies that you find in clusters tend to be uh, these sort of nice goldy or orangey colored things. We say red. So these red and dead elliptical galaxies. So the, the population is very different. These galaxies are sort of like uh, spherical or, or football shaped, whatever kind of football you like, really, uh, agglomerations of stars. Uh, and there's not much action going on in them anymore. So the star formation has stopped. So it's a very different population to what you find in the lower density parts of the universe. So here you'll find hundreds or thousands of galaxies. And if we go a bit further away, if you want to go up to 320 million light years, we, we finally hit our first rich cluster of galaxies. This is the Coma Cluster, the highly successful experiment is coming to an end as the child, screaming child leaves. Anyway, <laughs> so this is the Coma Cluster, 320 million light years away. Okay. So this one, more obviously, is dominated by these elliptical galaxies, so um, lots of old uh, stellar populations in these. Okay. So when we say a rich cluster of galaxies, what we mean is that a, galaxy, a cluster with lots and lots of galaxies in it. Okay. And these are all gravitationally bound to each other. So this is all these galaxies in this cluster are sort of orbiting around in this, this common system. Okay. okay, so I've mentioned a couple of different types of galaxies so far. Um, this is the um, famous uh, Hubble's tuning fork diagram. Uh, just to show the different types of populations of galaxies we have out there. So we mentioned the Milky Way is a spiral galaxy, Andromeda is. So all the spirals are over here on the right-hand side. We've got various different grades uh, according to things like how tight the spiral arms are, stuff like that. Um, and the guys which uh, dominate the population in clusters are these guys, so on the left-hand side. So the ellipticals and the S0 galaxy. S0 galaxies. Okay. So uh, Hubble didn't actually have the S0 in, in his original classification scheme, but these are essentially disk galaxies. They look a bit like faded spirals. Uh, they don't have as, any spiral arms, but they have a disk of stars, and they have this a, a, a bigger bulge component than what you typically find in, in most of these kinds of spiral galaxies. Okay. Okay, so uh, what are galaxy clusters? As we've kind of introduced them a little bit already, uh, and we've You'll hear this a lot, but they're the most massive gravitationally bound structures we find in the universe. In terms of their masses, we're talking 100 trillion times that of the sun. So that's 1 times 10 to the 14 and above, I would say, roughly. In terms of their, their physical size, we're talking of order 3 megaparsecs. So of order 10 million light years. So it would take 10 million years for light to cross from one side of a cluster to another. And as we said, they're full of these red and dead elliptical galaxies where, which are no longer forming stars, which is very different to the galaxies we find in like the spiral galaxies in, in the local universe. So in, in these, these cluster environments, most of the, the galaxies are ellipticals. If you're talking about a lower density region of the universe, something like 70 odd percent or something are spiral galaxies. Um, so I've got another pretty picture this time from the Hubble Space Telescope of a cluster at the bottom here. What you tend to find in clusters, another thing which makes them special, is that the central galaxy uh, is called something like a, a brightest central or brightest cluster galaxy, depending on who you talk to. These are actually the biggest galaxies you find in the universe. Uh, a, a galaxy cluster is a huge gravitational potential well. Uh, the galaxies which have collected together at the bottom of it, bottom of it have made this giant thing, probably. And, and um, yeah, these are actually the, the most um, brightest things in the universe, which are powered purely by starlight. Um, however, the um, light that you can see from the galaxies in this image is just the tip of the iceberg. Only about 5% of the mass of the cluster is due to the stars within it. Um, 
something like 15% of the mass of the cluster is in the form of hot gas. 80% uh, is in the form of this weird dark matter stuff that we can't see, but which we infer is, is there, okay, f um, from various different uh, methods. Okay, so um, one of the earliest ways in which this was, uh, one of the earliest pieces of evidence that we have for dark matter comes actually from observations uh, of the coma cluster, okay. Um, and so what people did, uh, so this is work by Fritz Ricci, who you'll see in a second, was to measure the speeds of the galaxies in the cluster. So if you take a spectrum of a, of a, of a galaxy, so we've got a couple of uh, cartoon pictures of spectra here. So you're splitting up the light into its component wavelengths. So this is a spectrum of the sun. Uh, these dark lines uh, correspond to uh, energy transitions in, in atoms at particular wavelengths. Uh, a galaxy, if it's uh, red shifted, you can see these spectral features have moved a bit. Uh, and what's happening here is essentially, at some level, the Doppler effect, uh, particularly if we're talking about uh, measuring the motions of things in clusters. Uh, so the Doppler effect is the kind of thing you hear in, in, the, in, the, um, in sound. If you've got like an ambulance chasing down the road towards you, you hear that the, the frequency shifts up as it's coming towards you. So it reaches a higher pitch. And it goes away down the road, it will go to drop to a lower pitch. Um, so this is the Doppler effect, and, and light behaves in a similar way. Um, so things which are moving away from you tend to be redshifted, things which are moving towards you are blue shifted. And by measuring spectra of galaxies in clusters, what you can do is figure out that the typical line of sight speed of the galaxies is of order 1,000 kilometers per second or so. Uh, and that's actually more than what you would expect based on the amount of mass you would think is there based on adding up all the light in the cluster. So this is uh, work which is originally done back in the 1930s. So here's a picture of Fritz Wicke, who, who uh, was one of the first people to come up with this. And he was doing this in the coma cluster, so measuring spectra of galaxies in our friend the coma cluster here. Fritz Wicke is this kind of cantankerous looking guy over here. And topical reference, apparently, according to Wikipedia, uh, he had an office down the hall from Robert Oppenheimer back in 1925, but he was at Caltech, so I don't know. <laughs> anyway, and so, yeah, so, so Zwicky, uh, 1937, published this paper, uh, which um, basically suggests that most of the mass inside a, a galaxy cluster is, in fact, dark. Uh, so these days we talk a lot about dark matter, and it's one of our central um, themes in, in, in explaining structure formation in the, in the universe. There's more evidence for dark matter, of course. So if you go to the 1970s, fast forward to the 1970s, uh, Vera Rubin and collaborators were measuring uh, these what are called rotation curves of spiral galaxies. And so essentially based on the amount of, of light that you see from a galaxy, we think we know how stellar evolution works. You can figure out how much mass should be there. You would expect that the stars around the edge of a galaxy should be moving more slowly. In fact, they're moving faster than we expect and you get this pretty flat uh, rotation curve. So typically in the Milky Way, these stars are whizzing around at a couple of hundred kilometers per second. Okay, And from the speed at which uh, these things are moving, we infer that there's dark matter. Because if you've got more mass, you've got a larger gravitational force, things are going to move around faster. Okay. Um, another piece of evidence that we have for a large dark component in clusters uh, comes from general relativity. Um, so um, this is the gravitational lensing of light, okay? So here we've got a little video. Um, this is the cartoon form. Um, even something like the sun will gravitationally lens light, so you can effectively see photons traveling on curved paths from around the back of the sun. So the cartoon representation of this, this, this little sort of rubber sheet you can imagine is, is the space time. You put a massive object there, it distorts the shape of it. This yellow line here is, is, a, is a photon, which is massless, but despite that, it feels the effects of gravity, as we're told by general relativity, and this will follow a curved path around the sun. Okay, and we'll see much the same thing in galaxy clusters. Okay, so this is just the little photon making its way. And if you, if you scale this up to cluster size, here you've got a distant galaxy. Here's our Hubble Space Telescope. Basically, clusters can act as giant lenses magnify and distort the shapes of galaxies behind them. And based on the shapes of those distortions and the number of multiple images and such like, you can figure out the mass, the, the mass within the cluster. So this is the total mass. And again, this tells us they're about 80% dark matter. 
So this is a galaxy way behind this cluster that's been multiply imaged, smeared out into these weird and wacky shapes, and gives you this giant arc shape in this Hubble Space Telescope image. Okay. Okay. Um, so we can learn a lot about clusters by studying them across the electromagnetic spectrum. So here's a slightly biased uh, plot of this kind of thing, sort of informed by the sort of stuff that I'm interested in. So across the middle here, we've got uh, the atmospheric transmission as a function of wavelength. Okay, so basically, if we're sat on Earth, mostly we can see we can do optical astronomy, we can do radio astronomy, we can do a bit in the millimeter, depending on where we are. We'll talk a bit about that later, and. The light that we receive from these, these distant objects tells us about different aspects of the physics. Okay. So if we look at very short wavelengths, so X-rays, which we can't receive on Earth, they're blocked by the atmosphere, then what we can see is the hot gas uh, trapped within the gravitational wells of the cluster. Okay. Um, so this is a nice little picture of XMM Newton doing its thing there. Um, <clears throat> We can also see the hot gas uh, through something called the sonyaev zeldovich effect at millimeter wavelengths. I'm going to get onto that towards the end. If we're talking about the visible and the near-infrared there, we're talking about uh, detecting starlight. That will tell us about um, the stellar populations in the cluster and the buildup of stellar mass. So uh, the universe is about uh, 14 billion years old, roughly, and you know, over time it has evolved and you know, star formation has been happening in galaxies and we can build galaxies up by, by merging them together, things like that. Uh, if you want to know about star formation, you can do that using ultraviolet observations. That tells you particularly about the instantaneous star formation rate, the young massive stars, which don't last very long. They burn very brightly, but only for a few hundred million years. Um, otherwise, you can also look at star formation in galaxies by looking at uh, dust obscured star formation. So where you have these uh, hot, uh, young, massive stars surrounded by dust, the dust is absorbing the UV light and re-radiating it in the infrared. Again, you can do that from space. This was the Herschel satellite, which was the last big mission for this. And we can also do this in the radio. So we've been doing this fairly recently with Meerkat. Uh, effectively, so here's a Meerkat image of a distant cluster. It's lighting up in the radio. Effectively, what you're doing when you're trying to measure the star formation in the radio, to some extent, is measuring the emission from the supernova remnants left behind by these young massive stars which have exploded. This is the Crab Nebula in the radio. So you can sort of think about it as adding up the total amount of the supernovae kind of what have been going off. That will tell you what the star formation rate is effectively. And then in the radio, with, with so we've got a little picture of Meerkat here. Uh, we can also learn a lot about magnetic fields. So this radio emission we're detecting is synchrotron emission, uh, which is coming from the fact that we have magnetic fields operating in clusters. Okay, so I'm gonna say a little bit more about this in a second. Okay, so going to the hot gas component. So stuff which falls into galaxy clusters tends not to get back out again, because they're you know, these ginormous, massive, very deep potential wells. So they've got to radiate away that gravitational potential energy somehow, and that's gonna come out at X-ray wavelengths, given the size of of the gravitational potential wells of these things. So here we've got uh, our friend the Coma Cluster is back again. Uh, this is an image from uh, the E. Rosita telescope on the uh, SRG uh, mission. So this was a German-Russian collaboration. E. Rosita is this guy here. This is somewhat on pause at the moment, as you, as you might understand. Um, and what we're seeing here is the hot gas, the signature of the hot gas in the cluster. So all this extended stuff we're seeing is, the, is plasma in the cluster, which has been heated to a temperature of, of something like 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8 Kelvin. Okay. The actual emission mechanism for this is something called Bremsstrahlen radiation. So this is German for breaking radiation. This thing is so hot that you've got a plasma. The electrons and the protons are not bound together to give you atoms. And so an electron whizzing around in the cluster atmosphere when it encounters a proton will slow down because it's attracted by the Coulomb force. And uh, because of conservation of energy, that will emit a photon, which will be at X-ray wavelengths. Okay, so this is why we can see them shining if we take X-ray images of the sky. Um, the other X-ray telescopes which are currently operating are Chandra and XMM Newton. Uh, these guys have been up since about the year 2000, so we don't get these X-ray satellites very often. Uh, so we may be waiting until the 2030s or so for the next one. Okay, so these are getting, a bit, getting on a bit in years now, but they're still doing good stuff. Okay. <clears throat> 
So now I want to talk a little bit about colliding clusters, which puts together some of, this, uh, some of these things. So here I've got a picture of the famous bullet cluster. Uh, it may not be famous to you, <laughs> but it's, it's famous to me. Um, so this is a, a, an image. In the background, you've got the optical and infrared image showing the, the cluster members. Uh, overlaid on this, you've got a, you can't see my mouse pointer. Let me move it. Hang on. I'm doing the wrong screen. Let's find it. Okay, this weird purple haze is supposed to show where most of the mass is. So this is inferred from these gravitational lensing measurements. Okay, and so most of the mass is lining up where the galaxies are. The pink stuff is this hot gas imaged in X-rays by the Chandra satellite. Okay, and so what's happening here is we've got uh, two clusters uh, colliding. The mass ratio is only something like one to ten, and it just so happens that we've got a favorable orientation and time when we're looking at this thing. So they've smashed through each other, and. Uh, the gas is collisional, so it can dissipate energy um, through interacting with itself, okay? And so the gas is lagging behind the galaxies and the dark matter which have sailed through, okay? Um, so this is telling us, uh, one thing this is telling us is that the dark matter is, is interacting largely only through gravity. You can place strong constraints on the self-interaction of the dark matter if it was a particle from, the, from systems like this. Um, so this is a nice composite of the optical and, and the x-ray. Uh, you can also see this thing rendered in cake form, okay? So if you apply a cake filter, this is circa 2013 from the cake shop at UKZN in Westville uh, and Mamita. <laughs> and so if we flip back and forwards, maybe you can see, where's my pointer? Look at these guys, right? They've, they've, they've put some effort into this, look. That's those guys. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, um, I should say though that if you want to render the night sky in cake form, that this requires a lot of food coloring, which has uh, consequences which are only apparent the following day. Uh, so you've been warned. <laughs> okay. Okay. So turning to the radio, in South Africa, we're very fortunate that um, we have the Meerkat telescope. I say fortunate. Um, lots of very skillful people have put that together, which is actually the best radio telescope in, in the world at the moment, I would say, a real triumph of, of South African engineering uh, skills. Okay. So that's uh, this guy here, right, and all these uh, telescopes. Um, so in the radio, uh, what we detect is largely, I mean, we can detect neutral hydrogen gas as well, but I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> we, we detect synchrotron radiation from electrons spiraling along magnetic field lines. So this is the cartoon view of that. Um, so if you've got a magnetic field, you've got an electron going around, it makes this sort of spirally pattern. It's emitting photons as it goes along, and in this way, it loses energy. Okay, And um, it turns out that this, this emission, you see it at lots of different wavelengths, but it tends to be very bright in the radio. Okay. And what we can do with this is, is uh, image galaxy clusters. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and so what we find is if you've got a case where you've got a, a, a colliding cluster, so here's our friend, uh, the bullet cluster again. So these are both meerkat observations. right? So this is work done by a pressure supposed doc at UKZN, uh, published earlier this year. Um, so this is the meerkat's view of the, of the bullet cluster. And so what we're seeing here is this uh, extended uh, radio source. Um, and what this is, is basically when you've uh, collided two clusters together, you've got these uh, high energy electrons floating around in the cluster. If nothing was happening, if there was no merger in the cluster happening, you wouldn't see anything in the radio. But when you smash two clusters together, you can reaccelerate these uh, electrons such that they shine uh, in, in uh, radio wavelengths. And that's what we're seeing here. And in fact, if you compared this to the X-ray image, you find that we've got this sharp feature here corresponds to what's called a shock in the X-ray emission. Okay, so the radio is, is really tracing what's happening in that intracluster gas just in a different way to what the X-ray telescopes do. I've got another picture here from Meerkat. This is from the Meerkat, again, from the Meerkat Galaxy Clusters Legacy Survey. This is from a paper by uh, Kendra Knowles. Uh, as currently at Soreo and uh, Rhodes University. And what this one really, what well, I highlight in this one really is this thing called a relic. So this is again radio emission from Meerkat. And this thing is of order the size of a cluster, right? So here's your scale bar, 500 kiloparsecs. This is megaparsecs across. 
And again, what this is probably marking is what's called a shock front, where you've got a fast-moving gas running into a slow-moving gas in this cluster collision, and it's lighting up in the radio. And, <clears throat> you know, these uh, images like this is, is possible now with the new generation of radio telescopes like Meerkat. In the past, if you look at radio, radio old-school radio observations, it looked like shreddies and things. It's, it's, it's yeah, <laughs> it's, it's amazing how much things have, have moved on. So there's only a few dozen of these systems were known. I guess this number is rapidly going up with Meerkat, which is very, which is very good for detecting this very extended radio emission. And this is going to, you know, the, there are open questions about what exactly causes this emission, the timescales of it how it evolves with, with cosmic time, all that kind of stuff, and we're going to learn a lot more in the next few years from this. Um, I've also got another example here. This is a more distant cluster. So this was the one from the film poster at the start. This one is called El Gordo, the fat one in Spanish. So it's discovered with a telescope in Chile, uh, which we'll get onto later on, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Uh, the thing on the left here, this is a composite uh, optical, infrared, and then X-ray image. So the, the ghostly, comety thing here, this is the hot gas again. And what, what we've got in this case is a roughly equal mass merger of two things where one thing is smashed through the other. This is the core of one of the clusters, and you've got this sort of wake trailing behind it. So this is the X-ray, and again, we can see this with Meerkat. So this is a Galaxy Cluster Legacy Survey data. Uh, we've got these relic things marking shock fronts, so big changes in the density in the cluster. And then between that, this sort of ghostly thing is a radio halo, so this diffuse emission, which is only showing up because of all this energy what's been dumped into the cluster due to the merger process. Um, we can also look at the galaxy uh, populations in clusters, and uh, just highlighting here some recent work by a PhD student, uh, Cabello, uh, Kessiboni. Uh, so again, this is using Meerkat, where we were use, looking at the Meerkat Galaxy Cluster Legacy Survey data. And, what we thought on the basis of this result was that um, if you look at these clusters which show this extended, X -ray, uh, extended radio emission, they're probably merging clusters. Um, in those, you tend to see a larger fraction of star-forming galaxies when you get out to these fairly large radii. Um, and we, this is not like a super secure result. We need to do a lot more work on this. The statistics, there's not too many clusters in this sample. Uh, but what's probably happening here is if you've got a, a merger between two clusters, um, um, you can generate uh, these shock waves, which is going to squeeze the gas and give you higher density, which can then trigger star formation. And this is totally unrelated work here on the right, but uh, you do see this kind of thing with galaxies falling into clusters. Uh, they, get, uh, they experience what's called ram pressure stripping. So this red stuff here is H-alpha and is basically showing the gas which is being stripped away from these, these galaxies. So it may be the case that uh, galaxies experience a burst of star formation and then uh, fade away after they fall into a cluster. OK. OK, so for the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk a bit about how we actually find clusters. Uh, so this is work I've been doing more recently. I'm going to start with a little bit of more ancient history. So I've got some uh, excitingly old pictures here. Um, so basically, there's three main ways you can go and find galaxy clusters. So one of the ways you can do that is in the optical. So people have been doing this since, in a systematic way since the 1950s. So there's work by George Abel, uh, Fritz Zwicky, the chap we saw earlier waving his finger. Uh, he's also done a lot of work on, on finding galaxy clusters. Uh, that was done using photographic plate data. This is a sort of slightly scabby, scan of, scabby looking scan of that. Uh, so all these pictures at the bottom are actually of the same cluster, right? You can do that with the X-ray. So people started to do that from the 1970s onwards. Again, you need satellites to do that. This is a very old school contour plot of a cluster uh, from Joya et al. 1990. So this is the Einstein extended the medium sensitivity survey, something like that. So I can only imagine what it was like <laughs> doing stuff back then without uh, the good computers. But anyway, that's what that looks like. And then this is the same cluster again, uh, more recent optical data. So this is from pan stars, actually, because there's a really annoying bright star messing things up. And this is the one I picked to do. Um, and yeah, we can also detect these clusters using something called the sunny erbs Zoldovich effect. But we've only been able to do that more recently. I'm going to get onto that in a second. Um, so wh why do we want to do this? So we've talked a bit about the cluster astrophysics and the things we can learn there. 
Uh, the only thing we can do is study the clusters to learn about cosmology. So if we can measure the signals from the clusters uh, accurately enough and understand exactly what we're measuring and crucially relate that to the mass of the cluster, then what that can tell us about is the cosmological parameters, so the amount of dark matter, dark energy, et cetera, that we find in the universe. Okay. So here's the uh, history of the universe encapsulated in one slide from the uh, WMAP uh, era uh, project. Okay, so uh, over here on the left is uh, the Big Bang, is over here. We've got quantum fluctuations and inflation. Here be dragons, stuff what's happening in the first second. So we have the Big Bang over here. Then over here, we've got the unfolding of cosmic time. Um, and so um, the universe, we live in an expanding universe. As the universe expands, it cools down. Uh, when it started off, it was extremely hot. Uh, the universe was filled with light. It was a plasma. But after about 380,000 years, um, the universe cooled down enough to be to, for neutral atoms to form. And from that time, uh, photons can free stream through the universe. And what we have here is this, where well, it's labeled afterglow light pattern. This is what's known as a cosmic microwave background. Okay? So this is the relic radiation from the Big Bang. Uh, and by studying uh, this oldest uh, image of the universe, we can learn a lot about cosmology. Okay. Uh, the story after that is gravity building up bigger and bigger structures. Um, the dark matter here is acting like a sort of scaffolding in which galaxies are being built. And clusters are going to form towards the right-hand side of this diagram as they're the most massive uh, sort of gravitationally bound things we find. Okay. And then uh, what's happening more recently is this: we live in this expanding universe. Uh, the expansion is actually accelerating. Um, uh, this is something we call dark energy. No one has a clue what it is, uh, really. And this was discovered back in the 1990s through observations originally of supernovae. So the, sup the distant supernovae were fainter uh, than what people uh, thought they would be. Okay. And so um, this expanding universe, what it does is it stretches the light, okay? Um, and so when we talk about cosmological redshift, we're talking about the, the, the stretching of, of the light from the spectrum of an object. And, um, okay. <laughs> is it? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the light is getting stretched, okay, as the universe expands, right? Um, and so when we talk about things at high redshift, we're looking at things deeper in cosmic time. We've got a plot here of the look back time versus redshift. So if we talk about something being at redshift one, the light from that thing is actually taken of order seven to eight billion years to reach us, okay? And so what we can do is we can look at the properties of objects at different distances. From that, we're actually learning about how uh, the universe uh, evolves, okay? And from that, we can do some cosmology. So when it comes to galaxy clusters, uh, what we want to do is actually count the number of clusters that we find in the universe as a function of their mass and as a function of their distance, their redshift, okay? So we can predict that from theoretical models. Uh, we want to compare our observation with the theoretical models, and that's going to tell us how much dark matter or how much dark energy there is in the universe and potentially what the properties of that uh, dark energy is, whether it's evolving or not. Um, so the theoretical predictions come from simulations. This is a cosmological M-body simulation happening here over on the right. So the, the white blobby stuff uh, these are these uh, dark matter halos, this scaffolding in which galaxies can be forming. And what you can see at the center of this is a forming galaxy cluster. So these are the nodes of the so-called cosmic web. The, the dark matter is, and the halos are streaming to form these filaments and build up bigger and bigger structures as time goes on. Okay. Um, so the key, the crucial thing with this, though, is that the theory predicts the masses of objects we don't actually directly measure mass. Um, arguably, we do with gravitational lensing, um, but um, this is the, the tricky part. So we've got to t be able to take some obse observational quantity related to a cluster and be able to relate that to its mass in order to use them to do cosmology. So when it comes to finding clusters in the optical, uh, what we do is basically look uh, for regions of the sky where we see uh, a higher number of galaxies. Okay, um, compared to some random direction. Uh, and one thing we can also use there is the color of the galaxies um, 
to help us find uh, distant clusters. And, and the reason why this works is if we look at galaxy clusters at the fairly early universe, so this is something about eight billion years ago, seven or eight billion years ago. Even then, the colors of the galaxies in the cluster, most of the population is kind of similar. So basically, if you look for these red galaxies in particular directions on the sky, the optical, you can find galaxy clusters that way. And a, a nice benefit of that is that it's very cheap to do, right? Optical telescopes, pretty cheap to do. We can do all that from the ground. The disadvantage is that then you, you then need to relate this to the mass somehow. And one of the ways people have been doing this since the time of a George Abel in the 1950s is to count galaxies. Um, so this is a more modern interpretation of that. This is a couple of galaxies in the Red Mapper catalog. It's a couple of clusters in the Red Mapper catalog. And essentially what we're doing is counting uh, the number of bright galaxies we see, and we call that the richness. And so here we've quantified that. This is a cluster with a richness of 34 on the left. Uh, it's very hard to... Uh, and then we've got a much richer cluster here on the right. And your hope is that something with more galaxies in it is more massive, and that tells you about the mass of the cluster. The disadvantage in the optical is that, you know, um, unless you've got spectroscopic redshifts of everything, you can get projections of things along the line of sight. So you can have a bunch of galaxies which happen to be red, similar colors, but are not actually physically related. And that's bad news if you want to do cosmology. So better ways to do this, uh, slightly biased here, is to look, at, is look for these hot gas cluster atmospheres. So you can do this with X-ray telescopes. Um, so the advantage here is you're detecting that hot gas signature. And X-ray uh, clusters are basically the only extended X-ray sources on the sky, unless you're counting things in our own galaxy, pretty much. Um, so I've got a fairly uh, ancient picture from a project I worked on for my PhD called the XMM Cluster Survey. So the PI is, is Kathy Romer in Sussex. Um, so we've been working on this for a long time using XMM. And, and these green things you can see are some candidate clusters. The red things are all... AGN, supermassive black holes, which somebody cares about, but, <laughs> well, we don't so much in this project. So uh, the advantage of this is you can, you can be sure you've got a cluster, and you can find these out to Redshift 2. The disadvantage is that it's, it's hard to search large sky areas. So even now, XMM is only covered a few hundred square degrees. Uh, and yeah, also because I'm biased, and this is kind of my party, <laughs> uh, here's a cluster we found back in my PhD. This was at Redshift 1.46 with, with the XCS, okay. Um, so this for a time was one of the most distant clusters known, okay. So now we're up to about Redshift two and a half, okay. Uh, but yeah, unsurprisingly, things which are further away tend to be fainter and harder to see. Um, so, you know, this is a disadvantage. So you'd think most things have that problem, but uh, no. So we have this thing called the sunyaev zeldovich effect, okay. So what is that? Um, so this is the inverse Compton scattering uh, of cosmic microwave background photons by the hot gas atmospheres in clusters. So what does that mean? Sort of illustrated by this cartoon here on the right. So basically the CMB is the light from 380,000 years after the universe formed. We're sat over here. A cluster has formed somewhere in between, right? The CMB is all around us. It's traveling through the universe. Some small fraction of those CMB photons are lucky enough to pass through a galaxy cluster. And an, and an even, you know, luckier fraction are fortunate enough to run into one of these high-energy electrons whizzing around in the cluster. What happens then is that the um, uh, photon gets scattered upwards in energy, okay? So if you look at a picture of the sky at microwave wavelength, so I've got this thing stolen from Planck here, this is a temperature map of the sky. If you look at low frequencies, what you see is a cold spot. That's fewer photons from that direction. Okay, um, and that's because those photons have been scattered upwards in energy by their interactions with the electrons in the cluster. And then if you look at higher frequencies, what you see is a hot spot, so that's where they've gone.
this slide is, um, we are. Ooh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so this site is now, um, the Simons Observatory has been built here basically, so a successor project. So we're getting a nice shiny new six meter telescope with a wider field of view, which will be able to do, which will be vastly more sensitive. Okay, but you can see in the, as this pans around, there's a bunch of other experiments up here in the Atacama. So the main reason is it's dry, you get in above the water vapor and that's what you need uh, you have very low precipitable water vapor here. This is what you need to do this kind of science at these kind of wavelengths. Okay. Okay. And yeah, so the main goal of this project is to measure this cosmic microwave background and measure temperatures on the sky of order, you know, tens, hundreds of micro Kelvin uh, difference. Okay. Um, so this experiment has been running since 2007 up to 2022. Uh, this is a project led from Princeton by Suzanne Staggs. Uh, there's multiple iterations of this. Uh, detector technology, the most recent one is something called Advanced Act. I'm going to show you that in a little bit. Uh, and yes, yeah, so if you've got a six meter telescope operating at these wavelengths, what you get is about arc minute resolution, uh, which is it's not great, but it's enough to see clusters out to any sort of reasonable redshift. And so here, this, this thing only works because of the operation of, a, of, a, of a, a, a large team. So this is the most recent photo I have of a collaboration meeting the last time I went to one anyway pre-COVID. Um, yeah, so this is the effort of an awful lot of people to make all this kind of stuff work. Um, so just to give an idea of the, uh, what the uh, six meter telescope buys you, it buys you an uh, increase in resolution over what's been done from space. So on the right, this is the Planck satellite. It's view of the cosmic micro background. All these bumps and wiggles are telling us about uh, the conditions in, in the universe, about 300,000 years. 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, and then on the right is the resolution of ACT, which is about, you know, depending on what frequency you're looking at, about five to 10 times better. The most obvious thing you can see here are the point sources popping up. Um, so these are largely AGN. And if you've got really good eyesight, you might be able to see one or two galaxy clusters, which will show as cold spots in this kind of map. Um, so for this project, we release our data publicly. So if anyone's interested in looking at our maps, you can go get them from Lambda. Um, uh, our most date, recent data release was data release five in 20, uh, 20, uh, 2020, 2021-ish. Um, so this is covering most of the southern sky. In the background here, you've got our galaxy. And the sort of survey area we've covered is this uh, multicolored thing showing how the depth varies with area. And so my part in this project of late has been helping to look for galaxy clusters. And so uh, what we've done with this project is construct a catalog of about 4,000 galaxy clusters, reaching out all the way to Redshift 2. Um, so we're talking about covering about 10 billion years of cosmic history here. Uh, and, and the goal of all of this is to use this to do cosmology. Okay. And so this is actually the largest uh, cluster sample that's been constructed using this Sonia Zeldovich effect. Okay. So we've got more than 200 clusters at redshift greater than one. So this is something which is very, very hard to do with X-ray telescopes, for example. So just to say a little bit about how we actually find the clusters. So uh, here's a map of the sky at 98 gigahertz. Uh, the cloudy stuff you are seeing here is this cosmic microwave background. Uh, can't find the pointer. There we go. Uh, so most of this stuff is the cosmic microwave background. The little white blobs you see here are sources. So these are largely AGN, so supermassive black holes um, lighting up. And then a little black spot you see here is like a shadow on the CMB. This is the signature of a galaxy cluster. Okay, so this is at 98 gigahertz. We observe at multiple frequencies. So you do this at 150, you get a slightly sharper view, but a slightly different size signal. And what you can do is apply a spatial and spectral filter to make the clusters pop up in this kind of map. Okay, so this is what we do. Um, so these things which are highlighted are galaxy clusters. And if you're bored, <laughs> you can go away and play with the code for this. So as well as having our data available, various of our codes are publicly available as well. And so what you want to do if you want to do cosmology is go away and measure the redshifts of all the blobs in this map. Um, these are hopefully galaxy clusters like this guy. Um, and with that, eventually you can do some, you, you can sort of, you can figure out how many clusters you actually see, how many you expected to see based on your knowledge of how the instrument works and what other sources of noise there are in the sky. 
And then from that, you can figure out the properties of the dark matter and the dark energy, ultimately. Um, so to do this kind of project, um, if you're covering most of the southern sky, you need access to a lot of different imaging. So we had help from our friends here uh, in the dark energy survey, and the hyper prime cam survey. Um, so basically, we use their optical images to get the, measure the distances to the clusters. So I've just got some pretty pictures of some clusters here at various different redshifts. Uh, you can see some gravitational lensing going on in some of these guys. So these are from Dark Energy Survey. Um, we've got some here from Hyper Supreme Cam. The contours are showing the SZ signal overlaid because the SZ is, is blobby and not as pretty as the optical. Okay. And then you can also use some fairly scabby looking uh, but useful infrared data from the Y satellite. So this is much lower resolution, sort of lower resolution than you get from the ground, but it's an infrared wavelength. So this allows you to detect things which are further away. And so with this, we can find some clusters out to about redshift one and a half or so. Okay. Um, so we inspected a lot of our clusters. And so a lot of this work we're doing follow up now and there's the community is also looking at, at various of these things as well. So the kinds of things we've highlighted are things like where you've got strong gravitational lensing happening. Okay, so this was a new gravitational lens we found. Uh, this guy in the middle is this weird pink thing. Uh, this is probably, uh, well, this is a star forming galaxy slash AGN. We're trying to figure that out. Um, so this is quite an interesting cluster. And then people are also interested in looking at multiple systems. So here we've got uh, a system of three clusters which are all at the same uh, distance, uh, roughly but they're sort of separated by a couple of megaparsecs or so. And so people are interested in looking at these kinds of systems which are close together to look at the, the for these filaments in the cosmic web between the clusters. Um, just in terms of, of how our entire sample looks, so maybe this is getting a bit technical, um, but um, <laughs> here we've got a plot of basically the mass versus the redshift of the clusters. And the thing to take away from this really our most distant thing is over here at redshift 2. I started off with the coma cluster at redshift 0 0.02. Uh, we're covering a huge span of cosmic history here. And um, we, what the, the plan is to use this cluster sample and the number of clusters we see as a function of redshift to tell us about what's going on with cosmology. Um, this funky spinny thing on, on the right here, <laughs> this is showing the uh, positions of the clusters uh, in terms of co-moving coordinates, okay? So it has a slightly weird shape because of our survey geometry. Um, we're at the center of this mess here. Each one of these dots is a galaxy cluster, and the scale here is in megaparsecs, okay? So there's, you know, there's gonna be a lot more information buried in, in this thing to do with the clustering of the clusters, and that may also provide us with some cosmological information. And so hopefully Krishna is gonna work on that <laughs> and tell us. <laughs> we'll see. Um, yeah, so just to finish a little bit of follow-up work. So um, we're doing a lot of work on this at the moment. So hopefully later in the year, we'll have some more results on measuring the masses of the clusters, which is what you need to do cosmology. So we do actually have some results out at the moment from one of these collaborations with the Kilo Degree Survey. You can find that paper if you're interested. Uh, we're gonna do cluster cosmology. It's, we're well overdue for this. It's 10 years since we've done it with ACT. SPT, the rival, the rival thing at the South Pole has done, has been you know, really the state of the art here at the moment. Um, but hopefully we'll have results on that later on. And various other things. I mentioned galaxy evolution, which is stuff what Cabello has been working on. Um, and just a couple more highlights from the radio. So here we have uh, another bit of work by Kenda a newly discovered radio halo and relic in an axe cluster in a fairly short meerkat observation. So this is a project where we're trying to systematically study how often these radio halos and, and relics occur. And then uh, looking at a more distant cluster, his name is censored. Uh, this is probably, we think, the most distant radio halo discovered to date. This is at redshift 1.23, so you know, roughly eight and a half billion years it's taken the light from this to reach us. And this is, you know, telling us something about magnetic field evolution in clusters. So clearly magnetic fields are already in place in clusters at this kind of redshift. Um, this is though looking at what's probably a merger of you know, one of the most massive clusters we know in the universe at this early time. Okay. So this is all the kind of stuff we're doing. Um, there's an awful lot of stuff still unresolved. Uh, fortunately in astronomy, uh, currently we're not short of new toys to play with. Um, so 
things we might want to answer, you know, we still don't know what the dark matter is, still don't know what the dark energy is. A question, I've highlighted the word precision here. Can we use clusters to do precision cosmology? We can certainly use them to do cosmology. Other techniques are more accurate at the moment, but clusters are potentially powerful. And there's a whole host of questions about the astrophysics, just highlighting, again, magnetic fields in clusters and, and the diffuse radio emission, because this is something we can very much do in South Africa with Meerkat, which is the best thing in the world for doing this. And later on, of course, we'll have the square kilometer array to do that as well. Uh, in X-ray land, we're going to be waiting for Athena in the 2030s to be a replacement for XMM and so on. Euclid, you may have seen as launched fairly recently. This is a, a mission to map the sky in gravita the gravitational lensing effects over a lot of the extragalactic sky. So that uh, was launched on its way in, in uh, was it early this month or last month. Anyway, it's on its way. And then Simon's Observatory, as I've already mentioned, is our next generation uh, CMB experiment, which will be good for finding clusters with this sunny Zeldovich dovich effect. Uh, so I'll just finish with my summary. Um, so as we mentioned, we'll bore on about this again, galaxy clusters, the most massive gravitationally round structures we find in the universe, uh, contain lots of galaxies. Uh, mostly they've got different populations to what we find, you know, on our doorstep. Uh, the stars are only part of the story. There's also the hot gas, and most of the mass is, in fact, in this dark matter. Um, we can use clusters to tell us about the evolution of the universe as a whole. We can do cosmology with them. Um, and there's a lot to look forward to in the next few years with all these new facilities we've got coming online. And we've now got access to these samples of thousands of clusters spanning about 10 billion years of cosmic history. Um, so I'm going to stop there. not short of toys to play with indeed. Uh, that was a fascinating journey into space and time, Matt. And I do want to commend you for working across a very, a very wide range, in fact, the entire range of the electromagnetic spectrum, making good use of facilities right here in South Africa, but beyond, um, elsewhere in the world and also in space. Uh, really delighted. I got, I got to say that we're most, most glad to have recruited you. Was it, uh, was it just last year? Then I thought you'd been here for a little longer. Um, to show up our astronomy efforts here at Wits University, and, and clearly you've settled in very well. Um, and I like the focus on data as well. I, um, really, a lot of modern astronomy is based on large data sets, and the ideas that you, you're developing in the astronomy context certainly very transferable to other parts, other disciplines within the Faculty of Science and elsewhere. So long may you continue with your excellent work at Wits University. So um, colleagues, I do want to acknowledge uh, a very good showing of, of uh, uh, members of staff. I recognize many of you from the School of Physics and beyond. Thank you very much for being here and, and showing support to Matt on this very, very auspicious day. Delighted once again to extend my warm welcome to um, Mrs. Hilton and uh, Brother Hilton as well but also Mrs. Dr. Uh, Hilton, who's, who's just stepped out for a moment then. So, uh, good. Uh, colleagues, it's my honor, really, to in invite Dr. Uh, Professor <coughs> Dina Naidu to, propo <coughs> to, to propose a vote of thanks. <coughs> Dean is the current head of school at, at physics, as you know. He's past president of the South African Institute of Physics and past vice chair of the Commission of uh, Commission 14, that's physics, edu physics for Education, or Physics Education, rather, of the International Union for Pure and Applied Physics. Program within the uh, ISOLDE, that's Isotope Mass Sep Separator Online Facility Program, and a member of the, of the International Collaboration Committee. Professor Naidu has been awarded several research grants and was a winner of the National Science and Technology Forum Award. I call on Professor Dina Naidu to move a vote of thanks. Thank you, Dina. Good evening, colleagues, uh, friends, and family of maths. Uh, indeed, it's an honor to have Matt in the school. Matt, this was an exciting talk. 
I think it's the first time I've seen you laugh so much in the last one year, full of excitement, and we look forward to that going forward in the next years. But colleagues, just to keep it short, thanks to, to all the colleagues from the School of Physics and the colleagues from the rest of the university for participating um, in, in Matt's inaugural function, including students and postdocs. It's much appreciated, uh, especially on a cold afternoon. Also, I'd like to thank Matt's wife, uh, Mamita, the little kid. I thought you did a wonderful job, uh, Matt, trying to weave you through the talk with a, with a well-disciplined kid, I thought. Uh, so well done on that. And also, a special thanks to Matt's mum and brother, who has come all the way in the last week to support you. And I think they're very, very proud of you, Matt. So um, welcome, and I hope you enjoy your stay in Johannesburg for the next year. I'm sure you'll be going to Durban uh, in the next days to enjoy the, the rest of your vacation. So, yeah, uh, colleagues, I think this is indeed a special day for Matt. Uh, and please enjoy it the remainder of the day in the next days. So we can truly call you Professor Matt Ilson as of today, officially. Well, still we have probation to go through, but we assume that goes well next week. Uh, but we look forward to you, um, and, and especially from what I see today, your enthusiasm, your excitement for the research field. We've engaged in the school uh, together with your colleagues in your group, and already I've seen huge positives from your side, and we thank you for that. And from the School of Physics, the faculty, the university, we look forward to all your significant contributions that you'll make in the years to come. So thank you very much. We're very proud to have you in the school. Uh, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Naidu. And so it's really left to me to close proceedings this evening. It's been a most delightful even, uh, evening. On behalf of the Senior Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Professor Rukshana Osman, Head of School, Professor Dina Naidu, I wish to extend my heartfelt thanks to each and every one of you for braving the bit of the cold uh, Johannesburg winter's night and being here this evening. Uh, please join us for refreshments in the, in the foyer. I kindly ask that you stand then and have the academic procession led by the Senior Deputy Vice-Chancellor to leave the hall. Thank you very much indeed and good night.